uh, for take home exercise one, I had asked you to think through the endogenous, exogenous, ignored distinction for two models. Um, one uh, was a somewhat simpler model involving hierarchical infection transmission. So this is a model where we have people embedded in cities, embedded in an overall environment where you know, it might be a region with multiple cities in it. Um, cities were connected, it turns out, with networks. Uh, but you had individuals within cities, uh, some of whom started exposed to infection, and the infection could then propagate. And so I asked you to, to think through with that model. I'll, I'll drag it up here. Um, uh, what, um, you know, how would those divisions come down for that model? So, so here we have the overall environment, um, and uh, then we have persons, but each person is located within a city such that when we run this model, uh, what we'll see is, is a, a network of cities and then uh, people uh, within them. So here's our, here are our cities, here's our network of cities. And uh, a certain uh, we're not seeing your screen. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, okay, awesome, okay, awesome. Um, thanks very much for, so it should look, whoa, look like this. Um, so here are cities. And by the way, the, the presence of a thick border indicates the city that's engaged in a lockdown and, and uh, is putting in place uh, protective measures for its population. Uh, people can move between cities. So you see some evidence that some of the people who are recovered, that's Magenta, have moved to this, um, to this other city, which is yet you know, um, unvisited by a lockdown. And generally this is, uh, the infection has passed. But if we had watched it from the very get-go, we would have seen, you know, people start overwhelmingly susceptible. Um, and uh, a few people will have been exposed in a way that will often lead to, so there's this, this person in yellow here, often lead to spread of infection between these cities. And you could see some people have moved from some of these uh, cities where the infection was earlier over to this city here in a way that might then start, start spreading there. This city has not been visited by active infectives as best I can tell yet. Um, okay, so, so here we have a model. We have, um, uh, we have these, environments and cities and lots going on what type of thing here is endogenously calculated can anyone can anyone say what things are endogenous in this model give me a few maybe give you one or two examples lockdown cities yeah the occurrence of whether or not a city is in lockdown or not is indeed endogenous and in fact if you dove in more what you'd find out is it depends on the prevalence of infection in that city. And once it reaches a certain threshold, the city imposes a lockdown. Um, so very good. Yes, lockdown of the occurrence of a lockdown and the, the presence of a lockdown is endogenous. We didn't pre-program in a schedule for it. it. It arose because of an emergent behavior involving the spread of infection. Okay, what's, what's another thing that's endogenous? for this model, anyone? What's another thing that the model is generating, it's giving rise to? The number of people who are uh, infected. Good, that's exactly right. The number of people who are infected uh, is, is endogenous. And in fact, that ends up driving the, the lockdown. The number of people affected in a given city affects whether or not that city is in lockdown. So number of people are infected is, is being, you could say calculated by generated model, by the model. It's an emergent feature of the model. It, it, as the model runs, it gives rise to that behavior. We didn't tell it how many people are infected at a given time. Rather, it reflects 
the complex interaction of people and their migratory patterns and who they're nearby and who they spread the infection to, um, uh, how, many, how many people are infected and which people are infected. Those are endogenous. Um, good, good. Um, any other factors come to mind that are endogenous? Uh, I wasn't sure of this one, but is the contact rate change when there's lockdown in the city? Yes, the contact rate. Great question. Great question. Uh, the answer is, and I wouldn't expect you to know this, but um, when a city engages in lockdown, um, uh, it's actually at this perform intervention event. Um, uh, if the prevalence exceeds a certain prevalence threshold, um, uh, we intervene upon a person. And for most of these, basically that involves lowering their contact rate. So not for all scenarios. And in fact, some scenarios um, uh, might involve, um, uh, you know, a different sort of, of intervention at time of lockdown. Um, and for example, you could change the migration rate, which could involve like a cordon sanitaire so that people can't spread or changing the direction of infectiousness. Um, those are all possible things, but you'll notice um, quite a few of them involve saying when there's an intervention to be performed for this person, set their contact rate to such and such, and, and here it's set their duration of infection. This would be set their contact rate. Oh, this, uh, this actually shouldn't uh, involve um, cha any change the, in, for their duration of infectiousness. So, so yes, um, uh, contact rate is generally changed by the occurrence of an intervention, but it depends on scenarios. For the baseline scenario, we don't have actually anything occurring right now when when it's in lockdown. So it's, there's no, it's a status quo scenario. A lockdown may be declared, but nothing happens. It's business as usual, which you know is often how the reference scenario is defined, the so-called baseline. The scenario, it's not privilege, but we kind of compare other scenarios against it as some reference point. Yeah, so good, good. Anyone else? Have we, have we listed every single possible endogenous feature of this model, every single factor that's endogenous? Anyone have a thought on that? The answer nope. is no, no, we have not. We, we, could, we could enumerate others and, and you know, um, it would get a bit pedantic at some point. The number of in exposed people is endogenous. The number of susceptible people is endogenous. The number of recovered, the number of infectious people recovered, you know, getting the number of new infections per day um, is endogenous. The number of waning cases or number of individuals who undergo waning immunity in a given week. I mean, we could we could go and 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 list out large numbers of these things that are close variants of each other. There's a set of coupled processes that are endogenous. And there are these different faces of it, these different kind of sides to it. Um, this infection status, that one, whether you're counting prevalent cases or, or you know, whether a given individual's infectious and uh, incident cases, um, cases within some period of time. Um, these are all just aspects of this coupled set of processes, which in here involve um, uh, infection and spread of infection, but it does involve one other sort of thing that's not actually really obvious in this state chart. And it's an absolutely key factor for the dynamics of this model. And beyond lockdown, which I really like, beyond lockdown, there's a third element that opens up a, a whole range of other behavior here. Any thoughts? Well, if you look yonder, you may, you may see something. It begins with an M. 
migration. My migration, migration. If if folks didn't migrate in this model, they'd all be infected. It, it turns out in a single city initially, and then they just spread it in the city, and that would be it. And that city would suffer, but you know, be like Wuhan, you know, um, undergoing a, an outbreak, and it ends in Wuhan. Um, but uh, but you know, infectious diseases don't work that way, and often it's not just pathogens which spread, but people move. And a key element in this model is people's movements and the movements to, you know, to different places. So um, here, the fact that we have migration going on endogenously, it's driven um, over time uh, with a certain rate and uh, where that in some cases, you might change that migration rate, you know, when the occurrence of a lockdown is, is indeed suggestive of, um, you know, an endogenous process. That's, so that's also endogenous, a migration. We're not, we're not specifying a schedule ahead of time of, you know, exactly who moves at what time or how many people move on what day. That all is resulting from the model. And, you know, as you might expect, if, you might posit fear-driven migration, where people maybe are more likely to migrate if others around them are infected, um, or uh, you know, if if not those directly around them, but elsewhere in the city are infected, they'll take up and leave without realizing they're infected. Um, um, sort of like the Nanjing Dama um, in China, who who you know uh, left one city. Uh, though she wasn't supposed to, to, and she went and played mahjong in another city and, and infected a lot of people. It was terrible. Um, so uh, here, sometimes people's movement patterns reflect, um, you know, what's going on around them. Um, so in any case, uh, what we have here is a model where we have a set of coupled processes involving migration and lockdown, and infection spread, which are endogenous. And we could go and slice and dice them different ways and, you know, talk about dozens of, at least, of endogenous variables. But um, at the end of the day, they're a set of coupled processes. And that's the way dynamic models often are. And agent-based models are, are not unique in that. Um, you know, we often have things so coupled that a lot of things kind of co-evolve. Um, and then there may be observer processes that kind of observe different aspects of that and tally it up to be compared with data or to project or to present information back to the to the user. Okay, so those are endogenous things. How about endogenous things here? Any thoughts? Oh, sorry, exogenous. Those are those were endogenous uh, things we enumerated, some we enumerated, but how about exogenous things? Exogenous, uh, we can see contact rate, waning immunity, immunity and um, um, completing latency and um, recovery. Yeah, okay. With a, so, so it's a good thoughts. Um, and in fact, if you go to city, uh, sorry, if you go to Maine, you'll find that there are assumptions we can put in for duration of latency and duration of immunity and migration rate and transmission probability, contact et cetera. Rate. Um, and uh, there may be a contact rate here that I would kind of expect there would be, but um, often there would be. But in this case, um, uh, there are, are actually cases where the occurrence of an intervention lowers the contact rate. It changes the contact rate as a result of the intervention. And the intervention is triggered by the occurrence of a certain level of infection in the city. So, so contact rate, and in fact, uh, there's also changing duration of infectiousness, you know, with the idea being maybe we, we do contact tracing, we discover people who are infected with an STI, uh, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and we get them in for antibiotic treatment, something like that. Um, or we get people infected by COVID-19 you know, early on, and we treat them with Paxlovid or earlier with remdesivir or whatever, um, uh, dethamexazone. Um, so, so here we, uh, 
you know, we actually, as part of a, of a strategy for intervention, that becomes part of the model dynamics. But most of those, you know, like duration of immunity, uh, transmission rate, uh, duration of latency, absolutely, those are exogenous. Those aren't affected by any of the dynamics of the model. Those are all upstream of kind of the model coupled process. So they, they set assumptions about this process, but they're not affected by it. Contact rate gets in there for some of these things where it's being affected by it. But, but I think that's good. How about other things that are, that are exogenous? Well, you can kind of read some off here. How about another one that's exogenous? That's pre-specified by a given scenario. Number of cities? Number of cities, good, yeah. The prevalence threshold at which cities declare a intervention, you know, a, a, you know under, undergo a public health order or whatever it is, um, enact a public health order. Um, a, so, um, you know, these are, these are good examples of exogenous things. There are cases where exogenous things are, are, are changing over time, but in a pre-specified way. So maybe we have, I don't know, some assumption about um, um, the warming temperature, you know, reflected in, in a climate change model. And we just assume that that's, heading in a certain time series, or we specify, um, we pre-specify, you know, what the temperature is at a certain time of certain day of the year. Maybe we read it in from a database historically, and we have a model of mosquito breeding, and one of the things in there is rainfall and temperature and humidity level and, you know, sunlight level on a given day or something like that. And we read it in, from a database or from a file, a CSV file or whatever, those are all exogenous. They're, they're represented in the model, they're told, but they're told to the model. Endogenous things the model tells us, it generates, it gives rise to them. Often they're coupled together and they interact, et cetera, um, for endogenous things. Exogenous things we're telling to the model. And it may be as simple as saying, you know, for this scenario, I want there to be five cities, um, whereas for this scenario, I want there to be 10 cities. But in other cases, it, it may be, you know, read the temperature per day temperature in, the mean, mean daily temperature in from this CSV file. And it will say, yes, ma'am, and it will go do it. Okay, so those are exogenous things. Now, in this area of infection transmission and cities and so on, what, what are some factors that are currently ignored in the model? What are, what are some factors that might, might affect this? I actually mentioned some. I said, you could imagine adding in a factor of this or that, but can, can you, like, in this general area, what would be a thing you you might think about putting in a model like this if it became just you know became richer over time. I don't see it in there, but seasonality might be important. Seasonality, yeah, um, yeah. It, again, for those outside of uh, uh, our our um, home and native land, uh, that we have this thing called winter, and people are less likely to move in winter um, because it's cold. Um, uh, yeah, uh, and and many other things besides cold. Uh, uh, it's also beautiful. Um, it's uh, age distribution. There's no representation of age in this model. That's exactly right. There's no uh, no characterization at all. Yeah. Uh huh. I have a question. Uh, when uh, messages uh, are uh, as uh, exogenous. Yeah. Um, uh, under when, this. Oh, when. Is it possible messages uh, become exogenous or not? Well, um, I mean, you could, you could have a situation where the model reads in from a file, like on what days should I send a, I don't know, uh, you know, 
um, infectious arrival message, um, you know, to um, to someone in the model or something like that. So you, you you could in a way have that parameterized in the model in a way that would be it's kind of all pre-specified. There's no and there's no emergent behavior. There's no model generating it. It's rather told from outside when to send this message and the and the sending of the message would just mechanically result from that. And I would call that an exogenous uh, exogenous thing. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I will, I, um, so I uh, didn't know if, if there was a representation of like exceptions to rule. Um, oh, uh, yeah, like someone migrating into a quarantine zone. Yeah, that's a good. Um, good question. Right now, there's no, uh, that's, that's a good idea for something that could be ignored. That's right. Right now, um, we have no exceptions to the rule. It's like, if there's an intervention in effect, um, everyone uh, who is um, in the, so where is it? it's in, it's in city, everyone who is in that city is intervened upon oh wait no, no well yeah sort of um actually this is interesting so this model does uh alex actually accommodate that because we have a we have a criteria which we can specify um so alex will understand if i said this is a little bit like a closure or something we say um is this person for a given person population are they eligible for the intervention and if they're eligible they get it but I guess you would say, well, you know, they're, you know, someone could be eligible, but basically just not adhere to the intervention, not comply, not, you know, not actually wear a mask or, or, or in fact, uh, you know, show up for a contact tracing appointment. And yeah, that, that isn't simulated. We could try to fold it into whether they're eligible or not, or, you know, is the intervention undertaken on them? But, um, but I, I liked your point. Yeah, there's no, there's no adherence or compliance as we used to call it. Yeah, good. What else is ignored here? Vaccines. Yeah, vaccines are, are, are totally ignored. Absolutely. Um, uh, so so great. Um, that's that's exactly right. Um, how about another thing? Another uh, thing that was prominent in the COVID nineteen. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, distance uh, can be uh, ignored. Yeah, Max so right distance. now, right, so no one is, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what you have in mind for that, but like for migration right now, a person, it turns out, if they are going to migrate, um, they, they sort of go and they get a random city to go to. They just pick cities randomly. And you could argue wait a minute, you know, they should go to a, they should be more likely to go to a nearby city than a further city. Um, and we might impose a gravity model where they, you know, they're, they're more likely in some principled way based on the distance to go to a nearby one compared to a far one. A gravity model would impose a kind of rule for how much more likely they are to go to a close one than a far, far one sort of inspired by kind of gravitational models, how strong the gravitational force is between two things. So yeah, so that's another good example of a, of a factor that's ignored right now. Good. Anyone else? Uh, uh, asymptomatics are not represented. Yeah, 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 good point. So um, right now we have uh, latency uh, represented, which you would say is probably pre-symptomatic. Um, they're infected, but not yet infective as well. They're also often pre-symptomatic too. But um, asymptomatics uh, are often, you know, really of, of, of concern in the context of infection transmission. So there may be people who are spreading infection, but don't know they're spreading it. Uh, very common for gonorrhea. Um, uh, Common for COVID-19, overall about 40% is estimated by the CDC and PHAC uh, fairly early, you know, by, by late summer 2020. Um, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's quite common for, um, for uh, 
some phases of herpes simplex, et cetera. And so, yeah, you can get um, asymptomatic individuals and asymptomatic individuals might be especially important when migrating. And Maurice maybe is alluding to this. Uh, it affects behavior because they might not know just to, to isolate. Um, they might not think to test, you know, in, in this day and age. Um, but they also might um, um, might migrate and might go go to another city and and play mahjong or whatever. So, so these um, uh, these these are definitely uh, a factor that you know would be reasonable to think as this model evolves whether or not not we might put it in there. And again. Um, the exogenous endogenous ignored is kind of a current snapshot of the model situation. And we're often, as we evolve the model, it's worth going back and looking at that and saying, is there anything that has been in the parking lot, which we might start to represent because it's been ignored till now, or anything that's been exogenous, we want to become endogenous, or anything that's endogenous, we really don't feel is, you know, is worth representing anymore because... We're, we're not as concerned about it. We're, we're convinced it's a smaller effect. Um, uh, we don't need to compare with data for it anymore. It, it takes lots of time in the model, whatever. And we might want to shelve it. So so I like that. Um, yeah, typhoid Mary, exactly, exactly. I uh, I appreciate your, your uh, historical uh, depth um, as always. Um, uh, that's exactly right. Typhoid Mary was a classic case who infected, you know, massive numbers of people in New York. I think she was a kitchen and I don't know the Bowery or something of New York, and and uh, she worked in a kitchen and and infected very large numbers of other people. Um, okay, um, good. So that's that model. How about um, we'll we'll try to whip through it, but the. Um, Introductory teaching GD. Oh, sorry, no. The the uh, the uh, model with food and physical activity environment. Um, so that's the food environment, convenience stores, and and supermarkets, and then it has the uh, the occurrence of parks, uh, etc. So what things are are endogenous? Can can any or Give, can anyone give me some some thoughts on things that are endogenous in this model? Weight outcomes. I, I'm sorry. Weight weight, oh, weight outcomes. outcomes. Yeah, weight outcomes are indeed. So let's 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 close this up so I don't confuse it with too many too many mains. Um, okay, and that's exactly right. So if we look at this model, we'll see that. Um, that a person here has an evolving weight and that weight reflects their energy expenditure as well as their energy intake and the energy expenditures due to physical activity and sort of basal metabolism rate. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. So, so that's endogenous. Uh, as we run here, we could go, we could go peek down and, and check out the, um, you know, where's the population here? Um, we could check out a given person's trajectory and it's being affected by their meal seeking behavior and, and their, their park proximity, et cetera. Good. Other, other factors that are endogenous in this model. And the number of people that uh, go to supermarket homes. That's right. The number of people visiting a given supermarket or visiting any supermarket in a given week. Yeah, that's endogenous. That's exactly right. It reflects their preferences and their distances from supermarkets compared to convenience stores and whether they food in their larder. Um, you know, whether whether right now they have food in the, the fridge, so to speak. Um, uh, if they already have both types of food, um, uh, they're, they're gonna go eat one or the other and it's only if if they're out that they're gonna go shopping for for food so yeah good um other other things that are endogenous here uh, uh, can we say uh, meal uh, meals or food remaining 
absolutely. Take a look at this. Um, get a load of this. So, um, you know, count of convenience store meals. This person is a high predilection, and I might add an unhealthy predilection for convenience store meals. And, and they seem to be subsisting on, you know, depending on the country you're in, um, you know, like pizza pops and, uh, oh, look, they actually went to the supermarket this time. Look at that. Um, okay, um, probably they were with mom or something. And and now they're they're just eating convenience store meals again. So maybe they ate pizza pops and, and you know, uh, Twinkies or something in North America, and and in Australia they eat meat pies and and floaties or something if they're in Adelaide, um, uh, or floaters. I can't remember what they're called. Um, but you know, other people might might have a rather different propensity. So this person does prefer convenience store meals, but they're going to the grocery store, and so they have a certain amount in of of food in their larder um and and or if it's they're they have a preference for convenience store meals but they're probably located quite close to a convenient to a supermarket i'm guessing because they seem to be going to the supermarket um very very closely um very very frequently um yeah um uh, other other comments are other ideas for endogenous factors from this model How about exogenous things in this model? Let's go back up here. What are some endo exogenous things? What are some things told to the model? The data from the GIS. Uh, and data from GIS, yes. Location of parks, location of supermarkets, location of convenience stores. That's read in from the GIS. There's a lot of sound and fury there, you know, a lot of work to, to read that in. And, I mean, there's a lot of mechanism to read it in, you know, computationally. I'm not denying that, but fundamentally it's being told to this model. The model is not generating the locations of parks. It's not putting a new park in an area where people have adverse weight outcomes, or, you know, it's not locating a supermarket directly in an area uh, because there's a food desert there right now, or because people's weights are growing. No, no, no. These things are all pre-specified. Um, no, no. Were you going to say something? Uh, I wanted to uh, say about energy. Energy. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so um, the amount of energy expenditure. Um, so there's energy intake, and energy intake is dependent on what they're eating, et cetera. It turns out. Um, so, so their energy intake is, um, if you go look at it, when they eat a convenience store meal or when they eat a convenience store meal, um, I think it, it leads to, you know, a, a higher level of energy intake than a, than a meal from, um, from a supermarket. Energy intake is the energy from a convenience store meal. When they eat a supermarket meal, they get an amount from the super or sorry from the supermarket meal and i think that's all pre-specified by just fixed amounts how much do they get from a convenience store meal in general versus a it's it's a fixed thing here um in terms of kilojoules so yeah or kilocalorie um that's exactly right um so energy intake uh is uh is isn't well, it's endogenous, but the amounts they get from a given type of food, type of subsistence, those are actually um, uh, fixed fixed amounts. But their particular, you know, uh, balance is is a reflection of of their emergent um, behavior. How much food they have left over, and what do they have in the fridge, and and you know their um uh their preferences etc yeah um energy expenditure um is uh is dependent on their weight so that's emergent and we said earlier so energy expenditure is emergent but um a physical activity based energy expenditure 
is based on the distance of their home to a nearest park and some factors from from parks and and really this is kind of a fixed thing for a given person they're in a certain home there's a certain distance to the park there ain't no emergent behavior going on there they're they're assigned a home at the beginning and they just stay there and from that it's preordained how much they're expending in uh physical activity which in this case uh, it looks zero which is which would be uh adverse um i've got to check why that is yeah um so good uh those are some endogenous things uh but we said exogenous that those are endogenous actually but these things how much they get from a convenience store meal how much from a supermarket meal those are actually fixed that's why there are those sort of lines through them um uh, what other things are exogenous here? Anyone? What other things are exogenous? Just told to the model. Well, I would I would go look at at your scenarios, and often they have parameters: the count of homes, population size. Whether we consider physical activity, oh, we probably don't have it on, that's why. Um, whether we consider physical activity and the outcomes, um, those are all, that's sort of told to the model. The, uh, the, the locations of the houses are randomly initialized, if I remember correctly. Do we call that exogenous? Okay, so this is a very interesting question. And it's one of the things I was hoping to actually talk a little bit about. Um, so, I was a bit glib when I say the model calculates, the model tells it to us. The, the better way to phrase it is it generates it. It gives rise to it as, as an emergent factor. Generally, um, you know, if there's something where we're just drawing it from a distribution, um, so we're, you know, drawing people's age from a distribution, um, at the least, what we would say is the distribution of ages is exogenous. Um, any given person's age, you could kind of say, well, you know, they're um, they're uh, getting. By the way, I'm, I'm using now this introductory teaching GDM, which we're going to take a look at right after this for today's lecture. And there, for example, um, their sex is drawn from a distribution. Uh, their their birth time and by implication their age is drawn from a distribution and so at the least we would probably to be careful about it. if i were writing a paper i'd say exogenous thing is the age distribution the age of a given person is drawn from it but i wouldn't call it emergent i wouldn't say it results from a complex interaction of a bunch of factors I would view it as pretty close to exogenous um, because it ain't generated by the model in any deep sense. It is calculated by the model, but it's not it's not given rise to the model as sort of an emergent behavior over time over space. It's it's kind of a uh, it, I would I would say it verges on being exogenous and, you know, I'd say, yeah, I mean, if you call it endogenous, I'd say the case is very weak, but yeah, okay, it calculates it. But really the distribution is exogenous. It's a it's a it's imposed on the model what the distribution is, and we just kind of mechanically draw from it. Um, I don't view it as kind of interestingly endogenous in any any deep sense. Um, initial conditions are generally exogenous. Now, there are exceptions. There are cases Maurice will, will know. Um, for example, if we, um, if we simulate a model, um, to, if, so sometimes we set the initial conditions um, based on a burn-in period that starts much earlier. Maybe it starts 30 years earlier and it runs to the present. I'm hoping to discuss this in a future lecture of this course, 
but sometimes we use burn-in periods uh, for agent-based and other types of dynamic models because we don't know the initial conditions. And so we want to arrive at initial condition, which is kind of an equilibrium. This is done a lot in system dynamics modeling. It's called equilibration there. But you know, often it's because we don't want to kind of have the model start in an out of balance state um, where it's it's just out of whack with, with sort of the natural dynamics of it. And you get all these observed behaviors that are really just a reflection that the initial state wasn't thought through or wasn't pinned down as carefully as it could be. So there you might give rise to it by running it. And um, I think you would say for the simulation period for all sense, it's it's kind of imposed on the model at the initial start. I'd still probably call it exogenous as far as the simulation period is concerned. It's a bit confusing because it it resulted from the burn-in period. But um, uh, you know, I, I in general I'll say I would consider it initial states exogenous. Um, interventions, yeah, interventions for most models. For many models, many models, they are and they are exogenous. We say, do this, simulate this intervention, and we see the consequences. Simulate that intervention, we see the consequences. There are exceptions. And earlier we saw a case actually where certain interventions are only undertaken under certain emergent conditions, like the prevalence reaches a certain threshold. And there I'd say it's tangled up with 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 uh, emergent behavior, and I'd say it's an aspect of emergent behavior. But you're right. Most for most models, we say now simulate it with this. So, but what if this intervention were in effect? What if that one? And it's kind of exogenously imposed on the model. Yeah. So that's that's good. Um, how about things that are ignored here? that might affect someone's weight over time. Anyone? Well, unless I missed it, I didn't see any sort of like adaptive behavior in terms of as your weight gets higher, you change your preferences on where you eat. Exactly. Great, great. Um, people aren't making a, a special effort to go to grocery stores if their weight is higher. They're not you know, going out and working out in parks or, or making use of parks, not going on walks um, deliberatively. Um, uh, so, so those are all, um, all excellent. And they're not getting, you know, in some areas, physicians are experimenting with prescribing physical activity, prescribing walks, and, and that ain't going on here, that's for sure. Um, so there's no adaptation. Could there be? Absolutely. I mean, yeah, an agent-based model would be a great place to explore that. This model, you could readily try adding that. Absolutely. Um, but um, this model right now doesn't doesn't include that. It's ignored. Great. Um, other ways to get gar food, exactly. Gardens, foraging, hunting, restaurants, exactly. Yeah. Um, um, in Saskatoon, I know, um, our fair city, we there's actually a fair, among lower SES individuals, there's quite an economy, particularly among uh, indigenous peoples of, you know, um, trading in, um, in, in fresh meats and vegetables, et cetera, from hunting or from gardens, et cetera, that, that can be really important for food security for um, lower SES individuals. Absolutely. So I really like that idea. I, it's kind of what's what's there right now is a very simplified representation of the food environment, and it could be provided much richer. And one thing I'll just add to Cassie's comment there is um, social support networks entirely absent right now. Right, we have no representation of of others to whom a, a person might turn for for food, um, mom and dad as an example, but but also you know, other relatives and, 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 and families and friends. Um, there's, uh, there's no representation of uh, social support when it comes to physical activity, absolutely. Socioeconomic factors, access to transportation, entirely left out right now. So right now you'll find if you study this model, people are moving along major thoroughfares and so on, but, um, Maybe they take a different path if they're walking or if they're biking um, 
or if they're in a wheelchair, um, they they you know end up having other constraints that might might affect their movement. Um, variation metabolism, yeah, that's quite right. Um, right now, also we're not having any length um, that uh, that reflects uh, the the metabolic uh, impacts. Uh, well, that's not true. No, there's there's some impacts of of uh, weight on basal energy metabolism, and there is some impact of um, um, on of, of of food food ingested certainly on 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 weight. So yeah. Um, any any other um, major things that that are ignored here? Thoughts? I mean. You you sort of look at the weight of every person, but then people are of different heights and genders as well, I think. Good, a a absolutely. So BMI is entirely ignored as a construct, but BMI itself has many issues. And, uh, you know, someone may have a high BMI um, uh, for very different reasons. Uh, musculature, for example, um, uh, and uh, versus, you know, uh, central adiposity. And so absolutely very, very, um, very simplistic representation. Good. Um, age is another one, right? I mean, age is entirely absent um, here. Okay. Um, so I thought that was a good discussion. I hope that's useful in thinking through some of the divisions in your models. Um, and, and, it, and, you know, we got into some subtleties that I, were, I was hoping to be able to talk with you about. So I wanna thank you for you know, uh, accommodating that, um, that digression, but I think this whole division into endogenous, exogenous, ignored, is one of the most foundational ones. And it's something we revisit as we model. And uh, it's good, you know, sharpening our thinking uh, about, about what's meant by by those terms with with actual uh, concrete models. So 